So you see that Suas Nanda Kumar is on the queue and he's, he wants to share slides. Uh, does anybody know what this is? No, I don't know. Uh, maybe there was a mistake. Uh, Everything is good, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I have the control. I have the control. Okay. <clears throat> so. It is, um, it's time. So we are going to get started. Hello, everyone. So this is the Chic Working Group uh, meeting. This session uh, is being recorded. So in case you're in the wrong room, you know, it's time to change. But this is going to be a very exciting session. So. Before we start, I we would like to remind you about the note well. Um, I see almost only known faces that are that know very well the note well, but I think in any case, you should be aware of it. As a short reminder, by, by participating in the ITF, you agree to follow the ITF process and policies. So this is an official ITF meeting and all policies apply. If you are aware that any ITF contribution is covered by patents or patent applications that are owned or controlled by you or your sponsor, you must disclose that fact or not participate in the discussion. As a participant in or attendee to any ITF activity, you acknowledge that written audio, video, and photographic records of meetings may be made public. Personal information that you provide to ITF will be handled with a, in accordance with the ITF privacy statement. And as a participant or attendee, you agree to work respectfully with other participants. Please contact the Ombuds team, so you have the link there, if you have questions or concerns about this. And this is, of course, only a, a short extract. Please read the full uh, BCP, all the BCPs that are listed here. So now we have this note really well uh, part, um, which is, I think, actually quite important. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but please do take time to read it. So um, it, we really want to have a, a, a place where people can work together uh, uh, in a decent and a respectful way. And uh, if you know, have seen something, or if, if you have been harassed in, in some way, there is an ombudsperson that you need to contact, right? Or, you know, we can, we can just talk to, yeah, there is the ombudsperson. So um, this having uh, been said, oh. what is this? Ah, yes, yes, we are going through the uh, meeting tips. So for the in, per, in meeting uh, participants, you know, you need to click on the meet echo light at least, or you know, to log in your presence. And if you want to step up to the mic, you can just click, and we will we'll give you the the the, uh, the in the in, in your turn. And for remote participants, make sure your audio and video are turned off, unless, of course, you are you want to uh, uh, are, you are chairing or you want to 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 say something or you are presenting. So we, you have the resources, uh, the agenda, Meteco, and the technical assistance. And right now we are <coughs> moving on to the agenda bashing. So we have the the opening, then um, OAM. <laughs> Uh, reborn, uh, updating RFC 8224, chic, ac chic access control. And then we go to chic flow compression, zero energy devices, and chic architectural proposal. Um, do you have any items, any other items that you would like to discuss today? So um, then I suggest that we go just an over, uh, you know, we, we'll continue with the meeting. Um, I'll, I'll do just um, a short overview on the Chic documents advancements. So um, actually, we uh, things have been advancing really well uh, before the summer, and there have been, you know, like we had a lot of discussions. Right now, <clears throat> we have two uh, active drafts that are the Chic architecture and the uh, Chic over PPP. Um, it, both of them, I think, are uh, expired. 
so we need to submit new versions. Um, on the architecture draft, we'll have some discussions. So, because there are some thoughts about, you know, in the in the latest development. So, I think that uh, we should uh, uh, reflect that in the strict architecture draft. And there is this new, very interesting work that we are seeing uh, that is coming: uh, the, the the access control, the zero energy devices, zero energy devices. I think that there is a really uh, uh, important part that is coming. Um, and the uh, update of the uh, 82, 88, uh, 24 draft. Um, and in our charter and in our milestones, we had the uh, the work about FEC codes. We have not yet started that, but I think it's time that we, um, you know, start thinking about um, uh, writing something there. Um, and. Um, uh, and, and and there is also this the new discussion about the flow compression, chic flow compression. That's also going to be uh, pretty uh, pretty pretty interesting work. In any case, um, right now I, I see a lot of new opportunities where she can be uh, uh, embedded and used in a very uh, um, in a very productive. Thing. Yeah, it can it can be used. So um, I, I think I'm going to stop here now. And um, I'm not sure, Pascal, if you, uh, Sergio want to say something. Sergio, please. Uh, hello, can, can you hear me? Hello, hello. Can, can, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well, Sergio. Uh, yeah, we, well, I have to do an update on, on, on two of the draft. And in the chicken streaming, one of the ideas uh, we have is to add the, the forward error correction also. So we will be doing some some analysis there because we believe that if we send the messages, each message can have some sort of forward error correction, so that that will decrease the, the need of retransmissions. So yeah, that's what I, I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, so that, that, that's actually a discussion that we we have with Bob. So please keep him in the loop because he's the one who started the the, the proposal. On um, for their correction as an alternate in, uh, to the recovery in the fragmentation. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, um, Bob, Bob Muscovich. Yes, yes. Actually, that's uh, that's a good point. Thank you, Pascal, for mentioning. So, uh, Bob had um, uh, some other uh, uh, th like some other documents on which he is working, and he he asked for some um, help with the with the chic rules. So I think we should, um, you know, organize a meeting with him and, and just uh, help him with the DTLS part over Sheik. And uh, actually, before uh, uh, passing the, the word to the next presenter, there is one other thing that, um, uh, so on today's inter-area meeting, um, there was the question about the IP, uh, the IP protocol number. And um, the question was, Okay, should this document remain uh, at the, in the in the inter area, or should we move it back to um, should we move it to the chic working group? Given that now we are a chic working group, right? We're not a LP1 working group anymore. Um, and the opinion and the decision was to that it's okay and that we should move it here, right? Um, so if I understand correctly, now it's Juan Carlos that is going to click the right buttons, uh, Eric, or should we do something about that on our side. I don't know where we push on the button, but it looks better. So, so Eric is coming to the mic. So I think it will be better if the authors submit a new version, just changing the name, changing the name of the draft. So draft blah blah dash chic, and okay. then when they upload, they say it replaced this previous document. Okay. I think that's way better. So that's we kill. Good. Two birds, uh, two two birds in one stone, mm. right? You change the draft name and you you put the right links, and it will be enough. Okay, perfect. So we need to, you know, we, we need to tell, tell the authors um, to to do that, uh, and then we should not, of course, we should not forget when we come to the working group last call to do a, a dual track working group last call in in uh, Chic and in the interior. Right. Um, so uh, that being said, I, I have nothing more to add and we can move on to the next uh, uh, presentation. Pascal, is it okay for you? Something to add? I guess, uh, Laurent, you're, you're the first. Okay. 
So. Let me okay, so I will uh, do the AOM part. Just a second, Laurent. Okay, so it's uh, a draft that has uh, been published by Dominique, and um, uh, we are working on AOM for quite a long time now. And so we, I think we have now something quite uh, stable that includes a lot of remarks. If you can go to the next slide, please. So we issue a version two, but version two because we had a lot of renaming, so it's, it's why it's only in version two. So we include comments that we have during the uh, last ATF, especially from Bob about making a better introduction of uh, the document. And we also include some clarification, but the document is still not finished. We have also some part to, to fill, but it's, uh, it's not uh, so, so difficult to do. So next slide. So yes, so about the organization. So we, we are now dividing the document in two parts. So the first one is how to compress uh, ICM PV6 for any kind of networks. And then we have another section that focuses more on constrained uh, networks. So what impacts the, what is the impact of the first part is first to design in the young data model all the field from ICM PV6 uh, header that will be uh, uh, defined. And one thing that may be a little bit different comparing to the other protocol is that the payload will also view as a field because uh, ICMPv6 is a kind of stop, stop protocol, and then we, we can also have to, to manipulate the, the payload in check. For the other scenario that concern more uh, optimization for LP1, so there is four optimization. So the first one is uh, the device, the device can, that can do pings. So here is something that we, we have to discuss a, a little bit, but we had a remark last time from Pascal that I wanted to generate some uh, huge or uh, larger payload. So just send a chic message and say, for example, increase it by uh, or generate a payload of uh, one kilobyte to test the network. So this can be done in a very easy way if the payload is viewed as a field because we can have in a rule a payload of uh, 1K and when we send the, the packet, we will send this, uh, this 1K. Uh, but it's not very flexible. We will have to put this uh, length in, in the rule. So we want to see if it's enough uh, to do that or if we, we have to find uh, other solution. The second thing is uh, the device is ping. So here, uh, we also add a new functionality into the core chic, which is to have action, what we call action or global action. So maybe the name is a little bit uh, confusing. We, we have this talk with uh, discussion with Ivan, but doesn't, uh, we doesn't like the term action. Uh, so the, the, name, the action decide if the compression is done or, or not. So, so sorry. When we a rule match, instead of doing comp uh, compression directly, we can call an action. And this action will do things generally on all, all the field of the, of the packet. And what we had this time, it's also that the, the action can decide if the compression has to be done after the action or not. And this way, we can have two behavior that has been uh, asked. The first one is to proxy the ping, and if we wait for a too long delay, we uh, don't send back the answer, or we send the information to the device and say, wake up and send me a, a ping. So with that, we can have this, uh, these two behavior. So the third uh, proposition is that Chic Core can generate ICMP error message if we don't match uh, the rules. So, and the last one is uh, to do compression on uh, error message that come from the internet of the destination. And we already talked about that uh, last time. It informed a device that there is a problem uh, somewhere. Next slide, please. Uh. 
So for, for action, so global action, action, I don't know which name we, we can use. I, I like action because we have CDA, which are uh, uh, compressed decompression actions that are apply to a specific field and action is applied to the, the packet. So it's now for uh, ping, but it can be generalized to any uh, regular message, the keep alive message that cannot be sent or is not very efficient to send it on the constraint network. And we can try to, to proxy the, these things. So it uh, generalization. So I don't want to spoil the rest of the meeting, but an hour or so we'll have to and we need it for uh, our drafts and flows. And so it's not well re written in the current draft, but the next time we will have a better description of actions. Want to say something? It's on no, 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 go ahead. So, okay, so uh, in fact, this draft, as I say, it's a very old draft. It's about six to seven year old. So it changed its name uh, a lot of time. And uh, so we will ask uh, the group if it's time now to become a working group item. So to have. Uh, oh, okay, yes. <clears throat> so uh, there was just uh, Anna that uh, she wanted to say something at some point. Anna, do you still want to? Yes, just the um, only point about the actions, but I will talk about that in the flow compression presentation. As you prefer. Okay, um, thank you very much. So, <clears throat> I, I, uh, so yeah. Well, first of all, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Laurent, for for the presentation. Uh, there is Carlos, uh, please, Carlos. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Hello. Just a comment about the fact that uh, you are considering adding compression for ICMP v6. I think this is very interesting because uh, there may be other documents where this may be useful. Uh, because, um, for example, in six low, uh, perhaps we might want to be able to compress, say, label discovery messages. So the functionality that may be included here will also be useful there. Okay. Yes. We we don't want to we don't work directly on IC uh, neighbor discovery. Yeah. But the compression of ICMP can be applied to that. Yes. That's yeah. Right. Exactly. So that will be already some some work done. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So about the question about <clears throat> working group item, I um, um, I don't recall I I, uh, I don't recall, but I, I I think that we had this adoption already in uh, in discussion, right? And uh, I I don't recall if we announced it officially on the mailing list, but I think so. Pascal, do you remember if we sent the um, the announcement to the to the mailing list? Sorry, Alex, I don't. Uh, but yes, I had in mind that we are ready to adopt this thing, but I don't know. It's, I, I think, think it's, in, it's in data it, tracker. Alex. It's in the data tracker that it's it, that it was adopted. Perfect. So but, I have no more questions. So I think, yeah, but I, I think so. First of all, thank you for for re restarting the work on that document. So Dominique is uh, remote, but I think there are some major ideas here and major points that needs to that needs to be discussed and uh, one thing that could be really interesting is for in light of some of the new technologies that we are talking about like the zero energy part that uh, uh, Edgar is going to talk about and some of even the, the part of, with the um, uh, uh, deep space communication <laughs> I mean I don't know it, it's maybe off too far but a lot of these things they, they come to you know to, to things you're treating here so um, so yeah, thanks, Laura. <clears throat> so uh, the next is Marco. Give me a second. Hi everyone, uh, this is Marco Tiroka. This is a status update on this document that now is intended, let's say, to revise uh, 8824 and the use of Chic for, uh, for co-op. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, as a recap, uh, we started this um, early this year, still in LP1, then moved to Chic, and, and the original idea was to update RFC 8824, um, describing how to use Chic to compress uh, code headers. Uh, also, an OScore is used. And it was all about uh, providing clarifications um, and then adding new content about, well, COP options introduced um, after the publication of 8824. Um, an explicit description of uh, what happens when Chic is used um, to the copilot marker, and and also being explicit in describing what happens uh, when co-op proxies um, are also deployed. But it was never intended to change a, a bit in the core mechanics uh, of Chic, uh, of course. Uh, but this intent of updating ATA24 was the case until the um, previous version 01 uh, of the document. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but uh, actually, already since uh, version zero, we uh, we got um, suggestions and encouragements about considering having um, a BIS document uh, instead for uh, obsoleting um, ATA24. Uh, and the strongest argument was to have uh, well a single place where all the up-to-date information um, can be uh, found, uh, and to focus there to provide whatever update, clarification, addition uh, to the original RFC. Um, it was suggested by Eric, first of all, uh, and then echoed by um, a number of people um, over the months. And um, we had uh, an in-room consensus uh, in the July meeting to indeed switch um, to a BIS document. So we were just uh, told to get ready for it. Uh, and there were no objections uh, about this. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so that's what we did. And the latest version two that we submitted is um, indeed a major uh, revision of the document, although editorial, I would say there's no breaking change really. Uh, and now it is written in a way that uh, reflects the intention to uh, obsolete uh, RFC 8824. Uh, so that's evident, first of all, from the title, uh, the same of 8824. Uh, and then it was mostly about restructuring uh, the content of the document so that it includes both um, the original content from um, ATA24 uh, with, with possible clarifications and extensions from version zero of this document, uh, and then the brand new content that we were proposing uh, until the previous version um, as uh, additions to the original specification. Uh, of course, we took the opportunity uh, and made some uh, minor fixes and clarifications and overall editorial revision compared to, to the previous version. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, I, I'd just like to guide you through the, the current uh, table of content and the introduction as this first part, basically uh, the same introduction of 8824 uh, as is, uh, but now it follows up with uh, a description, a justification of what is being uh, obsoleted uh, and how. Uh, well, sections two, three, four are really uh, taken from 8824 uh, as they are modulo uh, any, uh, any editorial uh, fix and clarification. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, things started to get uh, interested here um, in section five uh, when it was about describing how she compresses the options. And the first set of information is taken from uh, RFC 8824. Uh, with little additions that we already had in version one of this document for the options size one, size two, proxy VRI and proxy scheme, uh, and ETA give match and so on and so forth. Uh, but then the second uh, part of this section is instead about content that we uh, proposed as new in version one on this document. It's on uh, using Chic for uh, relatively recent options that in fact were proposed after the publication of 8824, uh, and it's only four, op limit, echo, uh, request tag, um, and ad hoc. Uh, next slide, please. Right, section uh, six already in 8824 considered still co-op options, but uh, they had a separate section because, well, they're quite a big thing proposing uh, considerable uh, protocol extensions, and this is about blockwise observe, uh, no response, and OSCORE. Uh, on the first three ones, it's the content from 8824, uh, on OSCORE, uh, well, there we consider the content from version one of this document that uh, was already building on 8824, but uh, considering recent updates that are happening on the OSCORE option um, by means of other documents uh, in the core working group. Uh, the section seven is uh, new here and is specifying uh, 
content from version one of this document on uh, what she does with respect to the copilot marker. And the content specifically in this section server considers the case um, without uh, OSCOR. Uh, later on, when a discussion on the OSCOR case uh, comes, uh, clarifications for that case also come um, somewhere in a subsection of, of section eight. Uh, section eight, uh, eight is uh, most entirely taken from 8824. Uh, so it's the example step by step of compression of co-op header uh, without OSCOR and with OSCOR. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, section nine and 10 are uh, new meaning taken uh, as they were <laughs> in version one uh, of this present document. Uh, and section one is introducing the content about describing uh, examples of message compression where uh, proxies are deployed. And here again, uh, without OSCOR um, or um, uh, with OSCOR. Uh, on section 11, the security considerations, this was really um, a blending. Uh, most was said already in 8824, and we are uh, bringing, it, uh, bringing it here too, but we are also uh, adding the, uh, the further considerations that we were proposing in section uh, one. Well, after that, uh, it, it's basically uh, uh, clerical tasks. We still have no IANA considerations, really. And of course, the set of references is, is larger. And we have still a placeholder appendix uh, on the Yang data model for uh, the compression of the uh, co-op options that uh, Loran started in, in our uh, Git repo for this document. Uh, next slide, please. And this is it. Uh, bottom line, this is still about revising 8824, but now following uh, suggestions and encourage directions. Uh, the document is written for obsoleting it. Uh, the new contribution is still about those uh, three points that we had in mind from the start um, in this present document, but now blended with the original specification to have all information uh, in one place. Um, we have a sort of roadmap in mind for the next things to do uh, on this document, of course, uh, listed here, and I also commented further uh, on the mailing list a few days ago, uh, suggesting to uh, build the bridge with proper pointers, references, and text uh, to the access control draft, and, and possibly moving out part of the uh, content from the early high-level sections uh, to the architecture uh, document instead, which makes sense. Uh, but let's say we believe uh, this version is definitely stable and a good starting point to uh, start the real uh, work as a working group item here. So uh, we believe it is uh, ready for an adoption call. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, a very significant amount of, of work that has been done since, since the last uh, version. Of the, of the document. I mean, I, I concur with Marco that it's probably time now to 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 uh, call for one group adoption. I think there is significant content in the new version, and it makes a lot of sense to me to 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 make this call. Laurent. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I totally agree. This is a very a new version with a lot of uh, good stuff, explanations. So that's uh, really worth to, to be a, a document for the working group. Uh, I have just a concern about kudos, because uh, kudos is some work on, on uh, core. And so is there a risk to block the, uh, this, uh, if, if this draft to be a working group, uh, well, RFC, if uh, Kudos is not ready? Um, well, procedurally, yeah, there's a chain of dependency, but I believe that when this work will be ready to be shipped, Kudos should have been way completed, definitely. Okay, thank you. So for me, from from this point, um, it is clear that I mean it, it's it's in our charter, and um, the the work. I mean, you have spent a significant amount of time. You have taken a lot of in consideration a lot of the commands of of our AD and uh, everyone in the working group. Um, so uh, probably, uh, if maybe if I can, if you can see just a show of hands. Uh, so I'm going to click the this one also on the on the web interface. Um, 
title. So uh, just to see a show of hands of a, like adoption, how do you how does the group feel here? So the people that are present and the people that are connected. So um, does the can I talk about this adoption? So if you can just go and and click your opinion. Let's give it 10 more seconds. Well, I see a good support for adoption in, in the room. We have uh, 13 people uh, in favor. We have six with no opinion. Um, and I see nobody against. So we'll confirm that on the mailing list, but uh, I believe this document will be adopted. Yes. Thank you very much. Yes. Perfect. Thank you, Marco. Thank you for, and, and, the, and the authors, really a significant work. And, and uh, we'll follow that closely. Thank you. So with this, uh, we are moving on to Chic Access Control by Anna. I don't know how to look. Yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, Anna, we can hear you. OK. So I'm going to present the update we have done for access control. And this is the third version of our draft we've done with Laurent and Ivan. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, the first thing we have added the terminology section to be agree with the architecture draft. Um, and the second part, we have defined some descriptor in order to be modified and, and get some default values uh, to um, improve the compression behavior. And in the third part, we have work in the co-op uh, headers, extensions and base header to define this uh, access control, then the possibility to modify this uh, descriptor of chic. Next slide, please. So as you know that chic has seven field descriptor, the field ID, the length, the position, direction, target value, machine operator, and compression, decompression action. And uh, at the beginning, we, we will think that this field descriptor has to be fixed because we have we know it about the description of the protocol. But in the real use, uh, we think that the target value is the first thing that we can uh, update, but not for all the um, protocols, but for some ones, for example, uh, I will show it later. But it, it will be illogic to modify the target value because uh, the protocol use different uh, values for hub limit, sequence number, and so forth. And in, in, our, this, in, in our interim meetings, we have discussed about uh, the jury path that could be modified, could be changed during the use of co-op. Um, so we, dis we decided in the second time to add uh, um, this uh, access control to the field description ID. Next slide, please. So in the field description ID, most uh, of the protocol will not change because they are fixed, but only the repeatable fields of co-op, uh, if you agree, we may have this possibility to be updated. In order to uh, reduce the number of rules we have to create to compress the different packets. Yes, next slide. And the target value, as I said, it will help to have a optimal compression of of the target value of different fields for example flow level of limit in ipvc's or sequence number for all the flow 
uh, protocols, UDP source port or all the repeatable uh, co-op extensions and some co-op uh, fields in the base head. And next slide. So we create some tables where we give uh, in the left column the access to the fill ID. So access to the fill ID. As you can see here is the co-op uh, the co base header and all are read only. So we cannot change the fill ID of the co-op base header. But for instance, we can change the target value for co-op uh, token length, uh, message ID and token because they, they may change in, in the use of co-op. The other, the other fill ID as version type and code are fixed and read only because they, they have not the problem, they will not change. Next slide. So next we, we put a very big table with all the co-op extensions, again, with the same idea of putting the access control for the different uh, fill IDs. So in, in yellow, you will, I show the repeatable extensions, like uh, if match, e tag, uh, jury pad, location pad, and so forth. And there are the only ones that are read write and the target value are read write. And my question there is, I don't know because I don't know very well co-op for the other extensions if the target values are read only or maybe also read write. So I will ask the help for some co-op boys to help us about that. Next slide is the next the second part of the table. Uh, just one point, Marco. Um, Anna, yeah. you have some questions. Marco, you would, like, yeah. would you? Would you like yes, yes. to? Yes. Okay. Uh, Marco, please. <clears throat> Marco is going to the to the mic. Yes. Hi, Marco. Uh, just curious about uh, URI port uh, because it's read only while um, any other option related to the URI is read write. So I was expecting something along the same lines also for uh, URI port. Okay. Know, maybe, maybe it's intentional. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, I don't know. Uh, I only put the repeatable, but perhaps I make a mistake. So you report no, is repeatable. No, no, uh, sorry. Uh, that read-only is fine. I I'm talking about the read-only for access control TV. Yeah, okay. That was my question. Yes, of course we can change it because that was the, I was not sure about that it was only read-only. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, um, okay, Anna, you can continue. So next slide, the, I will show uh, the next slide and the say and the next one is are all the extension of co-op, and in the yellow part you have the repeatable uh, fill IDs as read write, and the target values. So you can go to to my last uh, slide if you want. Yeah, this is the last part of the list. Next one. Uh, next slide. Yeah. And so the question now for us is to, to know if you agree to adopt this work to be a working group uh, document, uh, because we have work uh, in the different attacks we have done, we can have in the version two. And now we have this uh, access control for the updating of the data in the chic rules so we want to know if we can adopt this document for the to be a working group document Sorry, i think we've discussed the access control for a while now at least for 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 a year and um Yes, I mean, considering the stage of the discussion, I think we are pretty close to, to adoption uh, time, right, Alex? I mean, I don't see what we could be asking Anna or Laurent uh, to, to change or add before adoption. I mean, adoption is just the beginning of the journey. So if, if effectively we think we need this work, and uh, I believe 
we do, um, then I have no position for calling for adoption. Um, yes, yes. So uh, I, I, I agree with Pascal about this. And uh, but I, yeah. I, I was about to go to the mic, but anyway, so I, I agree with this, uh, with, with Pascal about the working group uh, uh, adoption. <clears throat> one, one thing maybe, and I'm not really sure about this, is um, do we need at some point, I mean, after it's adopted as a working group uh, uh, item, uh, if there are other working groups that we should be talking to in terms of, no. Not not for the time, no. So yeah, I mean, for men, for me, then that's that's good, and then we can, of course, deepen the technique, the, the the content part. Yeah. So I think that the second part will be to develop the same uh, access control for IP and UDP that we have already defined in eighty seven twenty four and eighty eight twenty four. Okay, for me, what is not clear, and we need uh, the view from the from the group, is what should remain, what has to be remain as a specific document, and what has to be included in the architecture. Because the goal behind that is that to you, when you have a young data model, and we will introduce management, we cannot allow uh, all the fields of the young data model to be changed. Otherwise, it can be uh, sec it can create security problems. So we have one part that is very descriptive, so that can be put in the uh, in the architecture document. But we may also have a normative uh, part that will be a young data model that will define the access right to a certain field that will derive from this document, and we have also some. Uh, Default behavior that can also be uh, put for for each field. So maybe just a, a quick reaction. For me, I, I would keep really the the access control part and all that here in in a separate document and not in the architecture. Uh, with also with the considerations of a type of attacks you are against which you are the types of threats uh, against which you're willing to protect and so forth. Because I I see actually a danger to put that in the like this kind of conduct in the architecture because like we it can slow down a lot the architecture document on one hand side and on the other hand side probably maybe in the future we can identify an, an additional security uh, related questions that can be or not related to the ACL and so that it will be good that you know how we have the opportunity to like to be in, in, in a separate document and not really tied to the architecture right the architecture should allow for this kind of things like to say okay well there is some kind of control if you're changing rules or something well like do make it in a document describe the the type of stuff and how do you protect against that but um you know i will not put it there um yes uh, pa pascal and then uh, Miriam. i i think you what Laurent said and what you said, Alex, is not contradictory. Uh, we need a little bit of text in the architecture to introduce uh, basically that the model can be updated um, and, and which proponents can uh, effectively do that. And if uh, both sides of the conversation um, have well the, and say that both sides of the conversation must be updated at the same time in a, a way that is transactional to make sure that uh, the, the two hands use the same state of the model. So, so the architecture has to describe that. Um, but the details of the rewrite fields, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, yes, this is this cannot be in the architecture. So the architecture must be must be giving the big picture, and it's uh, at that level. I don't think it will delay us uh, because it's a high level thing. Saying, hey, you know, there is this this guy who updates the the model needs to check that both hands uh, have the updated model to face commit, blah blah blah. Um, and uh, and then the, the new model, the updated model, can act. We we need to explain that in the architecture, but not not deeper than that. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah. Sorry, thank you. I, I agree with you on this point. Um, okay, um, Miriam. Yes. Yeah, so 
Um, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I am Mariam, uh, a student and researcher from Concordia University. And uh, this was so interesting for me because I am also uh, doing research on chip context. And so my question is that, uh, as I remember, you said that uh, these are some non-changed context in the co-op header, and these are the version, type, and code. And so uh, just to make sure, um, so we have uh, different codes in a co-op header, which can be included uh, in the method, like the, it being empty or get or post or success, the client error, or so we have uh, various uh, codes in the co-op uh, actual header and also the types and version and so on. And just, I want to make sure that, so if we are going to consider them as a context for each of these codes, we are going to have a separate context and rule ID. So it means that the number of contexts we are going to save in the device, for example, or the number of rule IDs are exactly proportional to the number of codes, right? No. Um, so, yes. Alex, can you please put uh, um, the slide six? This one? Yeah. So you see the code of co-op has uh, uh, different codes. They are in a registry and there are different numbers. And it depends if it's an ACK or it's an, uh, if it's a response or it's a, a, a CON or non CON. So there are two different codes. But in your rule, when you describe your rule, you can compress these codes independently if they are read or not read, read only or write. You can compress it in, a, I don't know, you can put a mapping list or you can do what you want. You don't need a rule ID per uh, code in co-op. You can compress all your code in, in one rule. Mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, I think you can, I got... you can read the 8824. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I got my answer. Yeah. OK, thank you very much. So um, I see the time running, so I'll just go. I'll. What I've heard is like general, like positive opinion about the draft, but I would like to see. Um, I mean, um, let's let's uh, try our our two show of hands. So um, <clears throat> adoption of chic ACL. So I've just started the uh, the uh, call of hands. Please click your opinion there, yeah. and uh, we'll yeah. take a minute to vote. Okay, let's give it a couple of more seconds. Okay, so I see uh, about a half of the people, like 10 people that are uh, positive and no opinion, a little bit more, like 13, so 50-50 almost. So I think it's a good support, but in any case, we'll bring it to the mailing list after uh, after this meeting. And depending on the results, of course, we will, we will, we will adopt. So thank you very much, Anna. Thank you. I and think I continue. Uh, it's okay. Uh, yes, chic flow compression. Yes. Uh, okay, okay, okay. So flow compression, and you have ten minutes for the presentation. I mean, for ten minutes for the slot. So yeah, go ahead, Anna. Thank you. So this is a new work we have done with Laurent, and is only next slide, please. The idea is to give uh, guidelines to compress the header of a flow, any flow, TCP, RTP, quick, or whatever, any protocol that creates a flow. Um, because uh, flows has dependency information among packets that we have not considered when we are compressing chic for an LP1 network. 
or for application for uh, an IoT. So then uh, here, what we want to, to solve this is the problem of how to compress this information that is uh, updated uh, packet by packet in this flow. Next slide, please. So, as you know, yeah, okay. Uh, SHIC performs packet independently of each other, and we don't have, uh, we don't keep um, the memory of what we have, what we have been done uh, or sent. We don't have a context update and uh, headers with uh, behavior that changing are not, or perhaps not optimally compressed because it will be difficult to, to know which is the reference value. And another important point from Chic is that you need to know, you need to have a lot of knowledge of what is the application using in, to define your rules. Next slide. So the idea is uh, to define, uh, um, to analyze how flows are defining this interdependence, no, interdependence, sorry. How flows uh, define this uh, dependence information uh, between all the packets in the flow and how they are changing and how we can compress them. Um, and so the idea is also to use the access control to update the information of the target value. That's why it was important that work. Um, uh, in order to reduce the number of rules we have, um, to use the young data model to manage this uh, optimization of compression, uh, to keep the reference values and to add an action uh, as um, I will explain later and, and to create uh, new rules that are derived from the base rules. So next slide. An action for us as has been defined in OIM is an indication in the rule to perform some operations. So as Laurent showed you for IAM, there are some operations that the action will make. For the flows, the operation will be to, to make a derivable rule that, the, the, that has the reference values in the base rule and that we can modify on updating these values uh, since the flows uh, advance. So we can uh, keep a memory we can uh, update uh, or make a better an optimal compression of, for example, the sequence number, the um, IP ID of IPv4, uh, or the time time of RTP, something like that, that, that today it will be difficult to compress uh, with one rule. Um, so for that, yes. Just a short question. <clears throat> so um, the, the action, how do you actually execute the action? Is it like a separate rule ID and when you send that rule ID that it does something? No, or for is me? It... Mm. Yeah. Sorry? How, how do you imagine that for... Or is it like some, some function that's executed when some values are... Uh, so how, how do you imagine that on the wire? Um, for me, the action is, is an indication in the rule, uh, a rule that you define with an action that is derivable. And now you know that this rule it will be used for a flow. So if you have a rule with an action derivable, in the flow, in what you are sending, there is nothing. It's all in the rule. Uh, all the information will be kept as an action in the rule. Don't you know that when you compress with this rule, you will need to keep your reference value and then you can update your target values of the of those uh, fill IDs that will change. And that's why it's an action. Yeah. So 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 uh, so that, that means that if you use some a particular rule, there the rule will indicate okay, I'm doing some compression or stuff, and then in addition I'm doing something else that could eventually create some new rule, not a right derived rule, yeah. or that like like this particular rule could so so just for me to 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 understand better, uh, 
you could have two rules that have the exact same compression behavior. Let's say rule one compresses in some way and rule two compresses in, a, in the exact same way. But rule two, in addition, will create some action. Let's say, I don't know, uh, 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 create an, uh, uh, rule three that takes some information from the, from the, that is more specific. Is this the way you, you see it? Yes, I presented that in the uh, slide six. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like that way. The next slide I can show you. So, for example, you receive a packet, you are going to compress it in your sort of rules. You have a rule that is, has an action derivable. Then you know that you have to keep the reference values. So you, will, you will use this rule that is 100 action derivable for a flow, and you will send it to B. B in his sort of rules, he knows, ah, I have this uh, rule that also that is action derivable, so I have to keep the reference values, and he can decompress and keep the reference values. So the next packet in the flow will arrive in A, and he would say, okay, now I know that this packet belongs to this flow, I have this action derivable, and perhaps my target values are out of the range or I can optimize it creating a derivable rule. So I will tell them the other side, I create a rule 101 derivable from the one I sent you before with the new, um, with the updated values of the, of the target values and so on. And at the end, at the end of the, of the flow, all the derivable rules will be uh, deleted because they are not uh, misused. You are only use it when there is a flow. You only keep the base rule uh, 100 action derivable. That's my last uh, slide. If you have questions, uh, Laurent has some something to say. Now, just to add that this management has to be atomic. It means that you need to have the same set of rules uh, on uh, both sides. So what is not represented in this graph is that you have all the management that makes that we are sure that this rule is known by both sides before. But this can be done with uh, conf uh, quite easily with uh, acknowledge message. So there is no problem to, to do that. Um. So uh, uh, probably I have a question here. What what is the use cases that you are pro probably you said that, but is there a specific use case? And and uh, Edgar has a question afterwards. For me, the use case will be uh, audio, video, or TCP. I would say any kind of flow that we have. So yeah. the main difference, for example, with Rock is that we don't create really. Uh, a flow ID or a connection, but we still have the, the rules, but we modify the rule to have this set of rules that can manage the flow. If it doesn't work, then we have the open rule that still works. So that's a, a big difference. We don't put things in, in, in flows. So the main thing is, for example, TCP, where you can have the sequence uh, number and you just send an MSB on this sequence number. So even if you if you don't have a lot of traffic, you can say, I take a very long MSB, and so I, I can compress a lot uh, the TCP header, and so it can be useful for LP1. Otherwise, you maybe you compress less, and it can be used for other kind of device. And you, if you have enough, enough space for handling the rule ID, then you can have a, a lot of flows as well. So you have all these uh, yeah. things to adapt. Okay, thank you. Um, Edgar? Hello, Edgar Ramos Ericsson. Um, I have a question re related to creating these rules. So basically, that's an overhead on a device. If it's a, the device who is receiving actually uh, these commands, then I'm wondering if the approach of creating new rules could be uh, being uh, so uh, uh, basically can you um, 
made the same thing by adding new operations instead of uh, creating new rules. Because uh, I think the, working with the rules is kind of making more heavy the use of the protocol because it, somehow it's a bit separate the management of the context and then the actual uh, compression. So, I mean, the compression engine and the compression engine. Then I'm wondering uh, what is really needed that cannot be done with maybe new operations? Yo, just a question. So what do you mean by new operation? Um, the thing is that I still don't understand exactly what a flow uh, needs that is different to a normal packet. So then what I was saying is like, if we could call an operation that could do that, that you want to achieve, uh, and, and the operation can be whatever, can be, I don't know, add one uh, sequence uh, or add two sequence to, to previous value, uh, and then do the same and include it already in the context. Of course, that would mean uh, an update in the chic specification. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I think from the implementation perspective, could be easier. Yes or no, because you need to, the most important thing with chic is to have the same context on both ends. And if you do it on the fly on a packet, and you use this packet, maybe you will have created the context in one side and not on the other side. And going to management, we can control the fact that we have, we keep the same information on both, uh, on both sides. And for the size of, we, we have to, to look at that, but in fact, you say, repeat this rule that already exists and add only on this target value and this target value and this target value this new value that will be uh, useful to have a more uh, complex co compression. And if it doesn't work, then we come back to the first rule that is not so efficient, but more generic. And then we can create another one. For example, when your seconds number increase in TCP and, uh, and boundary, you have a boundary of 16 bits, bytes, then when we, your value change in the first uh, 16 bytes, then you more efficient rule will not match. So we will discard this rule and create another one that will uh, do with the, the new values. So because just, I, just, I, I'm thinking that something based in patterns, for example. So if you know that there is a pattern, can you give the pattern uh, pre-allocated to a device and then say, yeah, this is the pattern you're going to receive? It can be, uh, so maybe we have to study that. For, for example, increase the sequence number, the target value by one, because we uh, we know that's the next uh, thing. You can, you can do that for the field that has a pattern, but for the field that doesn't have a pattern, how do you do? So, so ju just one point, I think that, so it's super yeah. interesting and thank you very much, Edgar. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Anna, for the presentation and, and Laurent. Uh, I mean, we are um, like a little bit behind the, the, the time, uh. but just to say that um, I, I really think that this is an interesting work and I would like, like to see some examples you know, maybe for the next presentation. And yeah. uh, there, there is something like, as, as you say, like you're putting your first foot in a, your, like the, the foot in, in something that's quite um, interesting, but let's uh, write it down a little bit more, describe it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I think we should get some uh, input about like, the use cases. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, th thank you very much, Anna. And with this, we're moving to uh, Edgar. Okay, hello everyone. Um, this is uh, our draft. So in, in the initial presentation, say Sergio Ramos, that's the guy who is my cousin who plays football. <laughs> 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 uh, 
So the real one is me, Edgar Ramos. Um, and then uh, my colleague, Lorenzo Corneo, is also working in this draft together with Anna. Uh, this is our first version. I thought to describe a little bit the landscape, if you go to the next slide. So the, basically what the draft contains is um, what is zero energy devices. Uh, we also focus a bit into what are the cellular zero energy devices and what is, has been studied in 3EPP. And then also uh, we talk about the lane friendly optimized transmissions for this kind of devices. A little bit about the context configuration. We haven't got fully there yet, but I started to think a bit. And then the payload compression, but the, that is actually not yet uh, uh, gritten anything, so it's for further. But uh, we, we would like to also look a bit into that. Okay, so next slide. So first I can maybe tell you a little bit about the different type of devices that have been thought for cellular uh, zero energy devices. So there is this device A, where um, this device doesn't have any energy storage. So you can think about it like an RFD tag. So uh, what they do is that they backscatter. So backscattering is that they reflect the signal, the radio signal. So there is a radio signal in the environment and they reflect that radio signal, do some changes to that signal. And then with the same signal that they have received, they basically are transmitting new data. So that is backscattering. In, in here, they are not generating anything. So they are reflecting. A device B has some energy storage. So they could actually uh, collect some energy from whatever source. It can be movements, it can be solar, it can be any type of, of source. And then they also use this kind of bus scattering for transmitting. So then basically uh, they will receive a signal from their, for example, base station telling now you transmit and then because they have some energy uh, storage, they can actually put more data and, and, and then make it more rich and even amplify the transmission. And then the device C is a device that it can generate his own um, transmission. So if, if on RF and it has an energy storage. And when I talk about energy storage, it could be a small battery, but mostly what we are thinking here is in high capacity capacitors, basically, that they can uh, harvest some energy and, and release it. Next slide, please. So then they have been a discussion on topologies. And the topologies is how these devices connect to the network or how they communicate. And then the topology one is what we are used to. So basically you have a, a mobile phone connected to a base station. So this is uh, the same. So an ambient IoT device connected to a base station. Later we have the topology two where you could have some kind of inter intermediate node. So something that helps uh, the, this device to communicate with the cellular network. So it will be some kind of proxy in between. It might be that um, they have different interface, <clears throat> but the interface of the intermediate device to the base station is the normal interface of radio, the cellular normal interface. That is what is called their UU interface. Uh, the topology tree, there is something called um, assisting node. And is that, uh, for example, the base station, if it wants a device to transmit, 
it might communicate with the assisting device through the normal uh, cellular interface. And this assisting node will, for example, generate a bus scatter signal that will make this ambient device to then transmit. And then the transmission can be uh, listened by the base station. Or the other way around, it might be that the base station uh, send the signal by scatter signal to the to the device, then the device transmit it, but it cannot listen the answer. But then there is this assisting device that receives that signal and then send it uh, through cellular to the um, to the base station. And finally, there is a topology four uh, where basically is a, a mobile phone communicating with this ambient device. So this will be very similar to RFID today. Um, about these topologies, at the moment in the draft, we would like to uh, focus in the topology one, it's the simplest. And there are so many uh, things that we need to consider and they, they are not yet defined of uh, uh, how this will work so that we will start with this simpler case. And then later, if we see that we have to address other different cases, so we can also take them in account. Yeah. Um, then about the user plane characteristics of these devices. So basically what they need is to save energy. They, they need to le little as possible utilize energy for the transmission, which is, means uh, every overhead, everything that uh, produce uh, um, is not optimized for the transmission is not, um, is not good. And the other thing <clears throat> is that you never know when these devices will have enough power for transmit uh, a packet. It might be that they transmit the packet one day and then suddenly it's raining and there is no sun. And then for some reason, uh, this device doesn't get any solar energy. And then suddenly uh, after two days, the sun comes out and then the devices start to transmit. So it can take long, uh, very long time until uh, you receive uh, additional packets from the device. Uh, of course, this depends of what is the source of energy and the type of device. If it's a back, backscattering device, it might be also different. Another thing is that the type of data they are transmitting uh, might require segmentation because exactly you want to try to optimize how much can you send? And you don't know, do you have power to send the whole packet? It might be that you don't. You only have to send half packet, at least that time. Then you do that transmission and you wait for the next opportunity to transmit the other half packet. Um, and then the reliability is another problem because many of these devices also for reception they need power, so not only for transmission. So how this uh, device get to know that the packet has been transmitted reliable? In some cases, there could be some cases where reliability is important. So then uh, we think that um, she could help here with some of the reliability features. Um, yeah, uh, next slide, please. So if we put everything together and we, we say, yeah, these are devices who transmit very infrequently, are uh, unpredictable and a small payload. This means that if you use a normal protocol over IP, you have to keep, for example, an IP address reserved for this device for very long time. Normally in cellular, you, you have an IP address for something like um, 
maybe 30 minutes. Or if you don't use it after 30 minutes, your IP address change. So then um, how can we tweak this so that it's usable, so that you keep the ports open, you keep the things over a long period of time over the whole infrastructure. And if we are thinking about over the top, it becomes quite, quite difficult because it means that every intermediate uh, steps has to be aware that this is a packet which is delayed. Um, so then we have been thinking about this plat platformization in a way that uh, it doesn't need to be from operators, it could be also from cloud, oper uh, cloud operators, where uh, they will receive these packets, they will be the ones getting the whole thing until it's together in something that can be consumed, can be, be used, and offer it through an API or through an IP tunnel that is created when the packet is reserved, uh, received like in, in a pop shop ma manner, for example. So then uh, that's one possibility. Of course, over the top it is possible, but it becomes quite, quite challenging. Uh, next slide. So then one possi also another possibility is that maybe we can tr treat these um, objects that need to be transmitted by these, um, by these um, devices as if they would be one IP packet. So then basically what we are, will be doing is using Chic a little bit as a transport protocol. So basically we, we will use the tile as the minimum size that the uh, a device can put together to transmit a transport block. And then uh, it will, uh, with these uh, different parameters, the inactivity timer and the retransmission timer, then finalize the whole, whole object. Uh, of course, this would be more useful for the type C devices, the ones that are having uh, their own signal and they have their own um, their own uh, battery. Uh, but then uh, the idea is that uh, they they could they are basically uh, not depending of the timers of the network, which will maybe clean up a buffer or time out certain connections because everything is established in the context. So all this will be established in the context. So then the network knows, okay, packets I receive from this device will be delayed maybe up to a week, and that's okay. Uh, next slide. Then how do you configure that context? That's also a tricky thing because as I say, reception in these devices also consume, consumes power. So either they are configured outbound, and it might be that you, you actually configure certain uh, kind of context by default. So we, we make a normative context one, two, and three, and then there's something that you know, okay, devices with context one has these characteristics device with context two has this characteristic. So, but then the issue is of course, how you notify what, what kind of context this device has. So it could be out of one. You could say, well, this is a, when you uh, onboard this device in some way, you might need manually put this uh, profile. But well, that's something to think how we can make it to work. Uh, and then in band, there could be um, some exchange where the network actually brings the context to the device. In some cases, if you think about it, this device might be everywhere. So let's think in a room like this, there might be already hundreds of those devices. So it means that the network needs to 
put parameters that allows to do um, network balancing so that the network don't get overload. So the parameters may be quite lenient, but then it might be different side to side. In some sites, it's okay to have parameters which are more aggressive. In other sites, uh, it needs parameters which are more delay tolerant. Um, but then here the issue is like, can we do uh, some kind of format for the context that could be efficient to be transmitted to these devices in an electronic way so that um, we could actually make it small, so small that also the reception of this context would be, um, let's say, efficient. And I think that's all I have. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to. So thank you very much, Edgar. Um, first of all, personal opinion, and I'm not speaking as a chair, but I love your work here. It really provides a very important use case, and it actually touches a lot of the things that we we are currently doing, like the 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 shake header, uh, the actions that that we, that is. I mean, it, it's really a very very uh, good use case, and um, I think it's something that for me personally, I would like to to see it advancing, and I would read. I, I really think it's a very important use case, um, and I think that we'll see other devices, other type of communication that could actually benefit a lot from what uh, you have put mm. here. Um, I'm thinking about satellite communications, where you can have devices that, you know, like right now with uh, NTN networks, you can have IoT devices like this sending a message once over to a satellite. So it's, I, I think here we can have a really, uh, like the, basically the same kind of, of tools that you're using. So um, I'm going to stop talking. Um, Miriam? Go ahead, Maria. Uh, so thank you for your presentation. And uh, my question is to just clarify for a part that you said that um, to solve the IP change problem, for example, you said that in 30 minutes, the IP will be changed. And so we might you lose the uh, process. So the solution is to set the timer in the cheek and to solve this problem. And uh, could you please uh, explain uh, more and uh, that how this is going to solve the IP change problem? Uh, actually, it's not exactly like that. It would need a standardization also on, in the 3PP because be, between the base station and the devices, there is no IP layer. So what they use is a MAC identifier. So then basically it doesn't matter for the base station what is the IP. But then um, in the internal network, so the core network of the radio, is the one who does the translation from the MAC layer to the actual IP layer. But then uh, in reality, what we would need in the radio is some identifier for that device. Not necessarily has to be IP. And then the IP will be proxy in reality. So if you go to the slide um, where there was the platform, yeah, that one. So if you see there, so basically uh, the IP would be something that will be provided either by the API or the, by the IP tunneling. So then basically uh, the device itself um, might not have a real IP. It might be something um, that the network just uh, assigned so that it later can do the mapping to the external IP. So it could be even a private IP. Um, thank you. So I we have time just for short comments, like uh, Juan Carlos uh, is next. I mean, if you can keep it down to under a minute. Juan Carlos Uniga. Um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Maybe something just to, to, to add. Uh, I, I support 100% this, this effort. Um, and to highlight the fact that uh, this is not specific to, to a single radio technology, There's a, there are similar efforts right now going on in, in the IEEE 211 group, for instance, on ambient power, it's called, but it's precisely the same, the same type of technology, backscatter, backscatter uh, passive, backscatter active, or uh, just low power, extra low power. 
and I think it's 100% uh, applicable to, to those use cases. So regardless of the radio technology, and, and Alex, you were mentioning satellite, I think this makes a lot of sense. So Great. Yes. And okay. then I think we have a lot of potential to do work here. Yes, yes, this is, this, I, this is what I hear really. So, Sergio, uh, can you just like in 30 seconds? Yes, just to say that I actually like also the work. We are also, now I'm working with satellite communication. So we were adapting the cheek streaming drop that I see also that there can be some matching there if there is a need for reliability. And also uh, I presented a rule ID exchange, a rule exchange message on, on a past meeting. So I believe that what you mentioned about using the control plane and using a, a way to, to exchange the context, well, I was planning on presenting this as a, as a document since uh, we have this message there. So I believe there can be a, a work that can be done there. Uh, so yeah, nice, nice work. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Sandra, uh, like yes, in 30 seconds. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thanks for, for this work. I just wanted to comment that uh, we have been looking into the uh, chic context uh, problem. And what you mentioned is that we are actually looking into a combination of having a small uh, uh, profile already in the device that is later updated with the actual parameters that we want for a specific application. So maybe we can discuss about that later on, but we are also looking into very constrained devices. So we, yeah, we can talk about that. That sounds very interesting. Later. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Edgar. Sim. And uh, Laurent, from 15 minutes, you are down to four. So Okay, I will try. <laughs> so I will try to resume some work that has been done by uh, a group that we call, uh, can you go back, the Archi Architects? architect and uh, so it's uh, something that uh, so it's with Anna, Ivan, Alexander, Pascal and, and myself and we work on, on the architecture and see how we can merge all the things that happens during the past year about about Chic and all the evolution and try to to put them in, into an architecture. So next slide please. Uh, so uh, the goal is to define an architecture that is very generic, not only uh, depending on IP protocols, but we can imagine that she can be applied to non-IETF protocol. So we have to be at a very abstract level at this point. That can also be layered because we have, uh, for example, in IPsec, in, uh, in co-op, we can have several uh, uh, layer. Pascal wanted also for PPP to have the notion of instance ID. And we have also to see how we can include the management in uh, that stuff. So next slide. Okay, so the first thing is that we introduce also a concept that is called a discriminator. It's, let's say, where is the origin of uh, uh, the packet? So it can be uh, based on source uh, address destination, MPLS label or connection ID uh, and TLS or anything else. And so it, we reach to that architecture. So next slide. So it's, uh, it's very simple in, in fact. So on the bottom you have uh, the discriminator. For example, here we have the source address and the destination address. When we have the sh chic header instance that will uh, manage if needed the chic header. And then regarding if we have different uh, instant indicator on the chic header, then we have different chic instance that depend of this uh, architecture. And of course, we have the set of rules that are totally different with different spaces we have at different levels. So we have no, all these rules are totally independent. So next slide. Uh, so to do management, which can be uh, look uh, uh, quite complex. So. One way will have to be put a bit in the shikader, but it's not so easy to, to manage. So what we, we propose, in fact, is to define a new rule nature. We already have a fragmentation, compression, no compression. And so we can add a new rules that will be uh, for management that will be totally independent of the rest of the compression. So it will be in, uh, in code this own IP stack. So we can, for example, have a link local address for identify both uh, sides, the application and uh, uh, the device. 
And inside this uh, type of management, then we will have only compression of uh, CoreConf on the way to uh, define the encryption of the traffic, because of course, when we do management, we have to, uh, to encrypt things. Uh, so here, right now, we don't have this rule, so that will be maybe some work to do, to, to do CoreConf, to do a doc and all that stuff, to have some nice rule for that. One thing is that we don't have to assign a rule ID for the group. Each, uh, the, um, each time you define a set of rules, then you can apply the rule ID that is convenient for, for you. But we can have some patterns some, uh, for, uh, for the management. So next slide. So it gives a little overview of what we have when we, we have the management. So we have a packet that arrives or a chic packet that arrives. So we have the discriminator here that tells you which stack we, we have to use. Then we have fragmentation reassembly. If we have a uh, compression decompression, we go to the instance. Or if we have a management rule, we, we can manage the uh, set of rules. Same thing when we go to the instance, we can have fragmentation reassembly. And then we can have management of compression decompression. So I have some example, but I think I have uh, don't have to, too much time to, to explain it. So uh, they are here if you want to, to look at it. And I think it's uh, a good way to, to go to the next interim meeting where I, we, I suppose we will discuss more about, uh, about that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laurent. Uh, sh any short comment? We are... So I, I think just to, to, to wrap up, the zero energy device use case, it's a very interesting use case that we also see how it maps with the architecture because it, it, it just seems like such a big use case. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, and, and yeah, it, it sounds, it, it looks like a really great work. So we'll need to get back to the mailing list now and then update the architectural documents from, from, from this, from this next center. With this, thank you all for being here and See you in our interim meeting. Oh, and, and just a quick short comment because I need to run, to run as well. New working group, but a lot of new energy and new projects. So I love your stuff. And yeah, <laughs> it's fascinating. Yes. As an individual contributor on this one. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. So, um, so yes, thank you all and uh, see you in our next interim. Bye. Uh, I close the meeting. I have to. <coughs> this session is recorded. I close? Uh, I close the meeting. I just uh, click. Is there a button to close the meeting? The red one. The red one. This? Yeah, close, yeah. But this is, I leave the room. Okay, leave the room. Ed Edgar, Edgar. I, uh, there is one thing. Can you maybe with Juan Carlos and. You know, just I, I think like this is such a fundamental document. Mm -hmm. Like there there needs to be some kind of an intro to describe like the topology, to describe the, the types of devices. It's it's amazing document. Mm -hmm. So I, I love that. So I would be willing to